in order to prepare ourselves and begin to go vertical this morning, we just need to lift up out of all this stuff that's happened this week. We need to get a new focus. And I want to invite you to stand with me. And, and in our standing, we're just recognizing and honoring the presence of God. We want to come and see life from a different level. And uh, to get us there, we're going to read one of the Psalms, Psalm 86. We'll read, listen to these words, pray, and uh, that'll just take us right into God's presence. So would you listen to these words from Psalm 86? Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant. Don't we need joy? For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are a forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call on you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy in the day of trouble. I will call to you, for you will answer me. Listen to this. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Let's pray. Father, we want to come into your presence and just allow you to take us vertical right now. Uh, we want to see things from a different perspective. Uh, we are disconcerted by things that are happening in our country. Uh, things just seem to be unraveling in many fronts. But we know that you are a God that is far above, far more powerful. You work things out together for good that loves those who love you. We invite you, Father, to take us, speak to us. We dedicate this time before us just to hear your voice and to offer our love to you as well. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. search the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise treasures of faith are never enough you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love this is from the scripture we read oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you You 
turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. We sing, there's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Lift our voices this morning. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. about the saving grace of Jesus and what he does in our lives. I went down to the crimson river, left my burdens on the shore. I went down a sinner, came up a saint, died with Christ, now I'm reborn. Yes, he washed me in his mercy. And he cleansed me in his blood. Now I stand complete. I have been set free. I found life there in that flood. Not the same. I am changed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By his grace, I am saved. I'm his child forever, I am. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Now I have the living water from the well that won't run dry. All the pain of life have been satisfied by the precious blood of Christ. Not the same, I am changed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By His grace, I am saved, I'm His child forever, I am. Take a seat if you would at this time, and as we uh, as we wrap up this time of singing, and we've been singing about the being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, we want to encourage you at this time. If you have the emblems with you, we're going to pause and we're just going to stop at the Lord's table this morning. 
And we're going to think about the goodness of Jesus Christ and all that he's done in our lives. And so if you would at this time, we're going to open up and we're going to take the bread and take that and think about the torn flesh on Calvary, uh, the body that was pierced uh, for our sins and for our transgressions. We also pause and we drink from the cup as we remember the blood that redeems us, that was shed on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, this morning we pause and we stop and we give you thanks that you have redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ, that you call each one of us to be a part of your kingdom, that you invite us to be close to your table, that we're all welcome at the foot of the cross. So, Lord, this morning as we pause and we take these emblems and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made, may we also think about our own lives. May you cleanse us of the sins that, that we've committed. May we find forgiveness for the things this week. And may we find a, a, a renewed spirit. May you wash us white as snow. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. And we pray for the encounter that we have with your word this morning. May you continue to motivate us, drive us to live faithfully for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great to be back here in Heath, Ohio. I was here about two years ago. Uh, I was invited uh, by Pastor Dave and uh, his team uh, to join them for a uh, retreat this past weekend up at some beautiful Christian camp where we talked about how to win more people to Jesus. Does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> That's right. That's what we're here on this planet to do, to tell people of a good news. There's a solution out there right now as we look at the events around the world, particularly here in our home country. Uh, things seem a little bit uh, up, up, not normal, let's put it that way. And uh, people need a Jesus. I think you all would agree with that. So, uh, again, it's a pleasure being here. And last time I was here two years ago, I kind of described, uh, kind of gave you a big view of what God was doing, the big story about what God is doing. And I tried to explain to you and lay out that, uh, you know, we live in an upside-down kingdom. Things that were one way 50 years ago are opposite today. Like, for example, Eastern Europe that were uh, enemies of the faith are now supporters uh, of the faith, and those in the Western Europe, instead of defending the faith, they're the enemies of faith. Uh, and uh, things are really changing around the world. The axis of powers are changing. The geopolitical uh, challenges around the world are changing. But there's a one God who never changes, and his kingdom lasts forever. Amen? So that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to set the tone, the theme, set the atmosphere for this morning uh, as I share with you. And it's found in Isaiah 42, 9. And it says this, See the former things have taken place, new things I declare, before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Former things have taken place. God was uh, Lord at that time. He was sovereign at that time. New things I declare before they spring into being. God is a not a God of mystery, particularly to his people. And God is trying to speak to us. In the midst of all of this chaos that's taken place, God is speaking to us. He's trying to get uh, our, our attention because a new thing is coming. Are you ready? That's the emphasis of today. And I want to talk about that. A new thing is coming. So before we jump into a deep dive into the church here in the United States, let's kind of do a quick review about some things that God is doing. Uh, maybe a reminder of some things I talked about two years ago, but just talk about also new things that God seems to be doing. Number one, I believe that God is doing a major recalibration of the church and the way we are doing uh, mission. 
Have you had a recalibration in the way you do church in the last few months, by the way? <laughs> yeah, we've all affect, uh, 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 felt the effects of a new way of doing church. But I think God is wanting us to go way deeper, okay? And I think your congregation on the leadership of Pastor uh, David and Donna, he's trying to listen to the voice of the Lord and lead you into the right direction so that we can capture the wind of the move of the Holy Spirit so that we can be in position to serve God and bring glory to him in this new age that is coming. Another point I want to emphasize, more Muslims have come to Christ in the past 15 years than in the last 15 centuries. I have a good friend of mine, he leads a, he is an Iranian pastor, and he leads a ministry called Iran Alive, and he pioneered uh, satellite TV, beaming the gospel right directly into Iran. And I was talking to him recently, we we're talking about the state of affairs in Iran and all the great opportunities there for the advance of the kingdom, and he said flat out, Iran is no longer a Muslim country. I didn't shake you off your seats yet, right? But it's true. It's true. The kingdom of God is growing. The greatest rate of evangelical church growth that we have in the world today is in Iran. Wow, that really shake you up, right? Okay, how about this? There's over almost 1,400 movements. That means people groups. There's large movements, massive movements of these people rushing into the kingdom of God. There's almost uh, 1,400 of those going on right now. That's not counting all the little things that's going on. These are massive movements, people that have historically been resistant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How about this? I think I mentioned this last time I was here. The Chinese missionary movement could potentially be the largest missionary movement in the history of the church up until today. Wow. Isn't that something? Right? I'll mention a little bit more about what's going on in China here in a moment. I think two years ago, I might have mentioned to you Hill 111, where the team that I work with, of which uh, David is, and Pastor David is a part of, we, as we were praying one day, we believed the Holy Spirit was challenging us to plant one million churches among 1,000 unreached people groups in just one decade, 10 years. Well, by the end of uh, 2020, uh, we think once the numbers all come in, we'll we will have reached that goal two years early. Praise God. You guys thanking God? You feel like in a praise God mood today? Okay, good. But be ready to be challenged as well. And there's also growing networks similar to the networks that we work with. And their uniting forces called the 2414 movement. And that's based out of Matthew 2414 where Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. We are racing to the end of, the, uh, of, of preaching the gospel to all nations. And I like to uh, say it by, uh, we are bringing closure to the Great Commission. We're getting it done. We can see the end uh, uh, before us. Why do I say this? And I also believe we're in the greatest time to be a missionary in the history of the church. The gospel is going out with power, and we're so glad to be a part of that, that we can see the end goal uh, is in sight. Uh, and I believe this because there's more Christians and more churches in more places closer to more unreached people groups ever in the history of the church. Amen on that one? That's right. God is on the move. When things are, seems like, what's going on? Uh, you know, things are changing. Things are moving too rapidly for me. God is saying, take a deep breath. So let's all do that this morning. <sighs> Take a deep breath and breathe out. God is sovereign. God is using the events. If we trust God, if we participate with God, if we raise the sails, sails of our lives so that we can ca catch the winds of the Holy Spirit so that we can be swept along uh, by the move of the Holy Spirit because I believe God is ready to break out into our lives so that we in the United States can experience the greatest revival, the greatest reawakening in the history of the United States. You guys ready for that? Mm, amen. Okay, we're going to talk a lot more about that this morning. But you know, the word of God, Jesus, uh, Jesus warned us. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come to bring you life and give it to you in abundance. So Satan is always working at the same time. He's not sleeping. He's not very happy when we're praising God. He's not very happy when we're serving him. But he's always working as well. 
Right now, there's a new wave of severe persecution of the Chinese church. Uh, a moment ago, I said the, the Chinese church potentially is, is, is uh, 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 having the greatest missionary movement in the history of the church. But under the current leadership in China, they are also persecuting the church. I don't know how much you know about history, particularly uh, uh, Asian history, but there was this time in the 1960s called the Cultural Revolution in China. It was a brutal time. The people were brutalized in, in, in that country, and it was a, a time of severe suffering, not only for the church, but for the entire nation. Well, talking to my Chinese friends, Chinese Christian friends, and I've been in China many times, even lived there before, they say that this current wave of persecution under the current leadership could be the worst or equal, if not worse, to the cultural revolution. So we need to be praying for them. What else is Satan doing? Did you ever hear of COVID-19? And you ever hear it's been mutating? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to have to take vaccines. You know, are they safe? What should we do as the people of God? You know, this is something that's going on. It's not by accident that all this is going on. But is there someone who is sovereign all over these events? Yes, there is. Uh, another point that I want to make, it is estimated that more Christians will die for their faith this year than in any other year in the history of the church. You know, there are people out there spreading the kingdom of God that are very, very, very courageous people. They know that they're putting their lives on the line every day as they share the gospel. And they intentionally go into some of the most hostile uh, areas of the world in order to bring the gospel. You know, whether it's true that this year is going to be the highest of any other year recorded history, I don't know. But I know there's going to be a lot of people giving it all up for Jesus. And again, I believe that uh, Satan, not only is God causing a major recalibration, but I believe Satan is involved in the major recalibration of the church and the way that we do mission. But Jesus Christ, he is sovereign. His purposes will come to fruition. I like that verse in uh, Psalms 33, 10 and 11. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord will stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart to all generation. God is not asleep. God knows exactly what's going on. But God has a singular purpose, and that is to bring his glory to the nations. And that brings me down to the, what's going on in the church here in America. And I want to take a look at that. You know, if you look at church history, well, if you look at biblical history, that's more specific, more precise, God chose a family line. We broke our relationship with God, and we created our own problems, okay? And we can confess to that truth in our own personal lives and in, in, in just our own society in which we live in today. We are usually the authors of the worst problems that we face in our life. Not always, but it's, it's, it's often. And God chose a people called through the family line of Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you in a great family. I'm going to make you famous. But with that comes a responsibility. And that your family line and that responsibility is that you will be a blessing to the nations. And God echoes that promise, that covenant to Abraham, to his son Isaac, to Jacob, and eventually to the people of Israel. Where God says, you will be also a light to the nations so that you might bring my glory to the ends of the earth. God is cho choosing a people. He calls us a holy people. Not that they were perfect, but we're set apart. And God wants to bless you, amen? How many of you want blessing in your life? We all do, right? Right? And God says, yeah, I'm going to be pouring it on you so you want to be able to take it all in. But there's a caveat there. And that caveat uh, is that we need to be on mission for God. When the people of Israel were on mission for God... God blessed them, and he protected them. But when they lost their mission, God punished them. God dealt with them. Okay, we're going to talk more about that in, in, in a second. But just to say that God is choosing a people, and he's going to bless them and glorify himself so that we can reflect his glory to the nations. Amen? Are we getting the picture here? And when we're not doing that, what happened in the book of uh, uh, Jeremiah, for example? 
All the prophets are saying, peace, peace, peace. All the people are saying, well, you know, we got this temple. We are the family line of Abraham. You know, we're chosen. We're somehow uh, immune from all of these things. But God told Jeremiah, don't even pray for these people. It's coming down. It's coming down. Where are we as the church in the United States? Do we still have time or is it coming down? So let's take a look. Is the church like the, uh, like the people of Israel when they're marching into the promised land? Or are we the church today more like the people of Israel when they were marching into Babylon as slaves? Well, let's take a look. Let's ask the first question. What is the percentage of Christians that embrace the essential and non-negotiable teachings of the Bible? Like, for example, the Ten Commandments are the ultimate, the ultimate moral standard for God that we all need to abide by. And that the Bible is accurate in its teaching. How many, how many Christians believe that? Well, here's some news for you. Only 9% of Christians and 19% of evangelicals believe, believe that, according to these experts that do these kind of surveys. You know what an evangelical is versus a Christian? Do you know why evangelicalism started in the United States? It's because the church abandoned the faith orthodoxy. And what we call the liberal church. So other Christians says, no, we want to be the confession, confessing church. We are evangelicals. We believe the word of God can save us. Jesus is the son of God. The blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's preach that saving message. Let's get the message out of there. Those are evangelicals. And it was a very strong movement. But now the essentials of the faith. What is this percentage that evangelicals believe that? 19%. How are we doing? We're going to talk more about that, why that might be, okay? How about this question? Is Jesus the only way to heaven? Born again believers. How did they respond in the survey? 67% believe that there are other ways to heaven. 67%. 47% believe that atheists will also go to heaven. And I'm sure the atheists are very disappointed about that fact. Okay, talking to my atheist friends. Okay, and then 37% believe Jesus sinned while on earth. So in other words, that makes the redemptive work of Christ on the cross irrelevant. I have a German background. We came to America as war refugees. I was a little baby. We fled. We wanted to have nothing to do with the Marxists, whether they were communist, socialist, or fascist. And we came to America to start a new life, to participate in the American experiment. And I'm one of those immigrants. I want to say thank you. I have received so much from this country and the values of this country. But, you know, we need to be really thinking about what's going on. The reason why I bring up my German past here is that there was a pastor in Germany at that time. He's a famous guy, and many of us know his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer spoke out against what was going on. And I believe we Christians should speak out, get on record about what's going on. And he spoke out about what was going on. And, you know, he worked with his pastors when things, when things started to develop. They see, hey, things are going a little bit sideways here. And uh, he got the pastors together, and they say, oh, yeah, we're going to stick this out. You know, we're going to stand up for the gospel. And then one by one, one by one, they all go. There's only a few left, and they decided to join, together, join hands together and call themselves the Confessing Church. Well, what is that? They say, we believe in the basic doctrines of the church. We don't want that to dis disappear from the land of Germany, and we will be the Confessing Church no matter what happens. And he gave an explanation of why he thought that so many nice German Lutheran boys, why would they go off and do all this crazy stuff, right? And I remember when I was a high school student taking history, and here I was a German. We're brought up, you know, Germans, hey, we're smarter than anybody else. We're stronger than anybody else. We could outwork anybody else. We don't need anybody else, especially God. That's the way I was raised, Okay. And then I thought, well, if that's the case, how come we did something so stupid? And I remember studying the history books, looking at really what was going on, and I was just shocked. And, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had his explanation. He said this, liberal theology laid the groundwork for the church to be swallowed up by Nazism. 
Brothers and sisters, doctrine is important. Holding to the truth, the standard, the biblical truth is essential for our very existence personally, in our marriage, in our family, in our communities, and in our country. Who's the defenders of the faith? We are. He goes on to say this about describing the situation there in Germany. He says, for many Germans, their national identity had become so melted together with whatever Lutheran faith they had that it was impossible to see either clearly. So after 400 years of taking for granted that all Germans were Lutheran Christians, no one really knew what Christianity, Christianity was anymore. Are we becoming that church today here in America? What is Christianity? You know, I hear people talk, see on YouTube or wherever, yeah, I'm a Christian. You go, man, you say that, but man, you don't seem to believe anything that the Bible says. <laughs> well, live accordingly. Okay, not a judgment statement, but we need to be discerning. The scripture says in these last days, we need a, a, a spirit of discernment, wisdom, being able to weed through all this stuff. We need to get in the Bible, and the Bible becomes our filter. I remember being going to the University of Massachusetts, as Pastor Dave mentioned. I went to a very, 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 very liberal place. I majored in biology. I've heard it all. I've seen it all. I lived in, I roomed in a uh, co-ed dorm. No big deal. Everybody does that. But it was a co-ed floor, too, and co-ed lab bathrooms. I was part of the experiment there in the good old uh, Massachusetts, you know. I've seen it all, and I've traveled around the world and lived in many places. Let's look at the American church on mission. 62% of believers say, believe that they should, what is that word? Not share their faith. Not that they are shy or a little embarrassed, they don't feel well equipped, a little bit nervous. They have made up their mind, not share their faith. Is that what really God wants? Let me tell you something. This big God, one thing I loved about studying science as an undergraduate, is a big God. We study the universe. We study all its complexities, physics. That means we're looking at the energy and the forces. And then we look at the molecular level, how things are just so fine-tuned and all of these kind of things. Well, this big old God who represents all that energy is bigger than all that grandness and energy and all that power. He's stuffed into these little bodies, Right? He says, we have received fullness of Jesus, fullness of God. The Holy Spirit is living in us. And when that Holy Spirit is living on us, he's got to be leaking out of us. Amen? We cannot control the forces of God, and we must live transformed lives in Jesus Christ. Let's, how did the church get in the state that I'm, I'm describing here in the United States? Do you think shepherds or pastors have anything to do with that? Christian leaders, do you think they might have a role in this? Okay, listen to this. Okay, there's almost 400,000 churches in the U.S. 72% don't believe the teachings of the Bible, nor do they believe that is, it is relevant for today. Makes me think of the scripture in 1 John 4, 1. This is the message translation. It says this, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone that talks about God comes from God, there are a lot of li lying preachers loose in the world. You like that one? <laughs> I love that one. How true is that? I think there is truth there. And we must not only hold one accountable, uh, one another accountable, but we must be personally accountable to the word of God and then hold our shepherds accountable to the standards of Scripture as well. Amen on that one? That's right. What depends on it? Our whole existence is the church here in the United States. Of the remaining 28%, okay, of that 20, almost 30%, 90% of those leaders, those shepherds, are not willing to talk about the most pressing issues of our time and that their members want answers to. Are there things in, the, in this world that you want answers to? There's a lot of confusion. What is right in so many areas? The church is so divided on many of these social issues today, and we need answers. What is the biblical standard? Is the Bible relevant to you? Being a follower of Jesus Christ and following the teachings of, Christ, uh, of the Bible, will that, will that lead to a better life, a more virtuous life, a more wholesome life, a happier life? 
I think so. That's why we live the Christian life. At least that's a choice that I made. You know, I know where my life was going. I definitely would not be here today if I didn't come to know Jesus Christ. Okay? My life would be completely different. I have three sons, and I tell them that all the time. Now, let's look at the early church, okay? Was the early church the way I just described the American church today? Well, we know that Apostle Paul, he lived till about 60 A.D., and he said that the gospel has been preached in a wide area. He started a movement of the gospel that, that kept on going. It started moving uh, to Western Europe, uh, Rome, and beyond there. And we have a historian, A.D. 197. How, how many years is that? 130-some plus years after the time of Paul. And we see that the church was still vigorous and healthy and on the move, even though they were being persecuted and murdered for their faith. And what did he say that was the, what, what he was seeing at that time? What was the influence of the church within society? Even Roman society, he says this, we are but of yesterday, and yet we have filled all the places that belong to you Romans. We have filled your cities Islands, forts, towns, exchanges, the military camps themselves, tribes, towns, councils, the palace, the senate, the marketplace. We have left nothing for you but your temples. Does that sound like a church on mission back then? Does it sound like we're on mission today? Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Because over time, the faith was accepted and legal in the Roman Empire. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if I was going to be just going to get eaten by lions and I heard, okay, you're free to practice your faith, you can go now, I think I'd be pretty happy about that. But with freedom comes responsibility. So over time, the church within the Roman Empire became very weak. And we have a historian, his name is Augustine. And he talks about what he observed. Why was it that the Roman Empire, this glorious creation of man, the Babel of its time, the Tower of Babel of its time, supposed to last a, a, a thousand years. It, it, it conquered everything, a, a, a mighty force. It's, it's, it's cities, it's education, everything. How could it ever fall? But it did. Who brought it down? Us Germans. <laughs> The barbarians, okay? And this is what Augustine wrote. He was another guy from North Africa, and he was, uh, he, he's a church father. And let me tell you, these ancient writings of our early church fathers and the early parts of the church, this is our legacy. This is our family history. We should be informed about these things even today as the church because this is our, our, our legacy that we've received. And we learn from history, don't we? He goes on, on to say of why the, the Roman Empire fell. He says this. He says, I'm dealing rather with the decay of morality, which at first, uh, which at first faded out little by little and then fell headlong into a torrent until even though the walls and the buildings remained intact, the republic was so ruined that even its preeminent authors do not hesitate to say that it was lost. What was the demise of the Roman Empire? Lack of virtue. Lack of morality. I like that one of my verses uh, that I like in Psalms of, of, in, in this, on, under this topic. He says, the wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. Is that a reality today? Yeah. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. But the word of God also conscious by saying this, when the wicked thrive, so does sin, but the righteous will see their downfall. Any amens on that one? Amen. You could say amen, even through your mask. <laughs> okay. Augustine then goes on, and he reminds the church that also went through persecution because the Goths, you know, they were pretty rough, okay? I won't go into the whole history, but it's very interesting uh, about the fall of Rome. But with the fall of Rome, the Romans were blaming the Christians of the, why they were defeated. They were saying that the Romans became Christian, abandoning the traditional gods of Rome. Therefore, the gods were not happy, and they put the blame on the Christians. And Augustine wrote a 10-volume 
uh, books, then volumes of books to give to Caesar to explain why that is not true. And it's very interesting, but there's a lot of detail. So he goes and he uh, reminds the Christians of back in the early church, back in Tertullian time, where he says this, when the Christian, will, when the Christian religion, which they knew would bring them salvation, in other words, he's talking about the Christians back then, and eternal glory was charged against them as a crime. So let me read that again. When the Christians knew uh, that would bring them, the Christians knew that the Christian religion would bring them salvation and eternal glory, that this faith in Jesus was charged against them as a crime. They did not choose to avoid temporal punishment by denying it. Rather, listen carefully, by confessing, professing, and proclaiming it, by enduring everything bravely and faithfully for its sake, and by going to their death and... Um, uh, oh, the, sorry, I better pull out my glasses. <laughs> sorry, I'm losing the impact here, okay? He goes on by saying, and by enduring, every, enduring everything bravely and faithfully for its sake, and by going to their death with what kind of confidence? Devoted confidence. They were the convinced. They put to shame. Let's all read this together. They put to shame the laws by which Christianity was prohibited and forced the laws to be changed. And then he goes on to say, and he admonished the believers at his time, and he says, let's all read this together, can we? If you believe it, let's read it together. We should endure all bodily evils for the sake, for the loyal, for they, and commending the truth. One more time for my benefit. We should endure all bodily evils for the sake of loyalty to the faith and commending the truth. God wants us to be faithful to the faith. This, brothers and sisters, this is our history. This is our family heritage. This is the, this is the, this is the church. Strong, lifted up, marching forward on mission with Jesus Christ. You know, a few weeks ago when I was preparing for this message and I was doing my regular Bible reading, I came across a section in Malachi chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, please pull it out, okay? Malachi chapter 3, and I was reading this section, and it started in uh, verse 13, okay? I'm going to highlight the, the end verse there, Malachi 3.18. And let me give you the context of all of this. They were believers, the people of Israel, they were believers, they were complaining to God. And this is recorded, it's a dialogue between the people and, and with God. And they say... Man, what a waste of time it's been following God. You know, we've been trying to be holy. We've been giving our sacrifices. We're going around repenting of our sin, throwing dust in the air and let it fall on top of our head and tearing our, our, our clothes because we're so sad. But where has it gotten us? And they go on and complain, you know, the, 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 the unrighteous, the wicked, they seem to be flourishing while we're doing not so good. Matter of fact, society is calling good evil and evil good today. So God hears all this. If you go and you read in that passage, God hears all of it. He says, okay, I hear you. And then the, uh, the righteous uh, got together and they say, no, we're going to stick with God. So God says, okay, let's, let's record all of this. And he pulls out a ledger, a book. And he says on one side, the unrighteous, those unbelieving, and the righteous. And he says, okay, let's pull, write this down for posterity. And then he ends this section by saying this. He says, you will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked and between those who serve God and those who do not. Let's look at that again. You will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. God says, okay, let me take your vote here. What's your name? Okay, how about you? All right, what side? of the ledger you're going to be on. Remember in the, during the time when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt? Did God make a distinction? He sure did. He made a distinction. The people of Israel in the, in the, in the encampment of Israel, when God was bringing judgment on all the gods of, of Egypt, who were mighty, who ruled the world at that time. That's why the Egyptians thought they were so great. Is there gods? 
And God began to make fun of them by the different plagues to say, this God is separate from the other God. The people of Israel, they're my chosen people. I'm going to make a distinction. And finally, God made the final distinction. He says, okay, all of you believers, go take a perfect lamb, offer, uh, sacrifice that lamb, and take the blood and put it over the doorpost of your house. Now, if I, if, you know, I, what, it doesn't say this in Scripture, but I think what happened is those that believe obeyed. Those that didn't obey, those that didn't believe, didn't obey. But the ones that were faithful to God, they put that blood on that, on that doorpost. And then says, okay, God says, this is it now. It's coming. And the angel of judgment came over the land of Egypt. And can you imagine the crying and the screaming in the houses of Egypt as the firstborn just died? How do you feel? You got little kids? I got little kids. I got little grandkids. Can you imagine the screaming in the morning? Because they were a hopeless society. The thing they feared the most was death. And they worshiped these gods that would prevent them from dying too soon. And when they died, they went through all this elaborate processes in order to send them into the next life. Death was greatly feared by the Egyptians. And they were hit in every home, firstborn. And there's the people of Israel. They're hearing the screams coming closer and closer and closer to the encampment of the, Israel, uh, of the people of Israel. What do you think they were thinking? Hey, is this blood thing going to work? They took the step of faith by making that sacrifice, putting the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes by faith. And by faith, they, they were in their homes, covered by the blood of the lamb on the entrance of their door. And when the angel came over the land of Israel, what happened? Quiet. Quiet. God has his ledger out, and he's going to make a distinction. He's made a distinction then. He's been making a distinction all through history. Word and name, where's your name going to be? On the ledger of God. God says, I'm going to make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between those who serve God and those who do not. My question to you today is, you know, we have a beautiful thing. God gives us a choice. That's the way he made us. Where do you want to fall on that ledger? The word of God says, when we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our sinful nature, God made us alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And God gave us a way to deal with the slavery that we find ourselves in. And it's some kind of form of sin. You know what's going on in your own life. And God says, you know, he has given us reason. And the way we, we uh, express our reason as human being is to use speech. By our own free will, by our moral choice. And he says, if you confess your sin. Those sins will come into the hands of Jesus. Every one of your sins. You can be set free. There is, a, there is a solution. There is a remedy. And God says, you confess your sin. Frank, you confess your sin. Boy, he had his hands full when, he, when I confessed my sin. And when Jesus was laid on that cross and those nails went into his hands, he was nailing our sins on the cross as well. And you can be set free. You know, we can talk freedom politically, but if you're not free spiritually, you are still a slave. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So where are you on the ledger? The choice is yours. The time has come where God is going to make a distinction. Can I pray for you? The cross is always there before us. Just confess. Live totally devoted to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk in his freedom. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and its power. We thank you, Lord, that we can experience your freedom. We thank you that we can experience your power. We can overcome anything that the enemy throws against us, even if it requires suffering and challenges in our life. You are great, and you and you alone are worthy to be worshipped and devoting our entire life to, Lord. 
We thank you that even though you are so great, your word says, if you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. Father, I pray that we will not turn our backs on your forgiveness, Father, that we avail ourselves to that blessed hope that we have in the blood of Jesus Christ who washed us and set us free so that we will, can walk in wholeness and be holy in your hands, Father, so that we'll be instruments usable to change the tide, the direction of our lives personally, in our homes, in our community, in the country, and in the rest of the world, Father. You are the hope of the nations. We believe it. We confess that. And we thank you, Father. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit will bring a sense of conviction. Drive out the powers of darkness that blind us and keep us in bondage, Father. You are Lord. You died for us. You set us free. And I pray that we will experience that reality in our lives at this moment and through the rest of the day and through the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. This morning, if uh, the things that Frank has, has brought to you from the Lord uh, inspires you or challenges you, encourages you in some way, and you want to have a follow-up conversation, Frank and David both will be here uh, after the service so that you can talk with them and begin a spiritual conversation. Uh, if you're online or if uh, you just prefer something uh, set up later on, you can also text the word RESPOND to our text and church number. That's 740-303-7898. Again, just text the word RESPOND to 740-303-7898, and you'll get an automatic reply, and you can begin that conversation. I also just want to remind you, if you are new or would like to find ways that you can get more connected here at the church, we encourage you to stop by the connection point. Uh, say hello, receive a free gift, and, uh, and maybe find some ways that you can begin your next steps here with the Heath Church of Christ. I'd like to for, ask you to stand, if you would, please. And as we finish our time this morning, uh, I want to take in just all the things that, that I've been hearing this morning and soak those things in and figure out, God, what do you want me to do next? Uh, with what we've been challenged with, with what we've heard as we think about a new year, new perspectives, and new opportunities. And so we want to use this as a time that we reflect, we think about all that God might be asking us to do as individuals, but also what is God asking us to do as a church. And so let's just use this time as we wrap up just to worship him and to begin to set our hearts in the right place.
reasons to trust you, nothing to fear for you are by my side. I follow you anywhere, follow you anywhere. Oh, 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 oh. I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, 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 oh. Wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me. All I want is you to say, wherever you lead me, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I want is you, Jesus, all I want is This is our prayer this morning, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I I run to you are the fire that leads me through the night I'll follow you anywhere there's a million reasons to trust you nothing to fear for you I'll by my side I'll follow you morning is our prayer that as we leave this place that we would be determined to follow you wherever you may be leading us father may we have a heart that says uh, i surrender all not just i surrender some god may we be focused on you living faithfully for you declaring your word being messengers of your gospel peace god may you continue to equip us and encourage us as individuals but also as a church we thank you for jesus and we thank you for his redeeming grace May we live in that this week, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to be back next week. We're going to start a new sermon series called Movement, and we want you to be a part of it. Hope that you invite somebody to be here also. Have a great week, and God bless.